have sadly, at least in my mind, reached the last psalm that we're going to look at in this little series. You could have at least went, oh, bummer. <laughs> could have done something. Golly. We ended up looking at 10 of the 150 psalms, and I've loved this time so much that I, I thought as I begin a new series, we just might often take what I'll call a psalm break. And just head back to the psalm some. I want to stand and I want to say before you that I'm so thankful to the Lord for this study and this time together. You may remember at the first sermon I said to you that preaching the psalms felt daunting to me, a, a little nerve-wracking. And the reason is that I had never, in spite of spending a lot, a lot of time in my Christian life in the Psalms, I had never studied them in depth, nor had I ever preached any of the poetical writings in our Bible, for that matter. So this was new territory for me. And to study poetry, songs, and then to preach it just was something I hadn't done. But I do want to stand and thank God because it ended up being the, the richest time that I can remember in my study. The kind of studying I do is called exegesis, and that's just a fancy word that means to study something and analyze it in depth in its original language and in its original historical context and understanding who wrote it and why they wrote it and then bringing that into our context and our world. That's exegesis. And I'd never exegeted these psalms. It was so rich. So I just thought really quickly before I got into Psalm 73, I wanted to say, I hope you take away at least four things from this time in the Psalms. Number one, I hope you see them now. If you didn't before, I hope you see the Psalms as beautiful because they are. And we're drawn to beauty. It doesn't matter what form of beauty that you're drawn to. We're all drawn to beauty. It can be a flower that you're drawn to, or it can be a good throw by a quarterback, right? A good throw. We say, that was beautiful. Did you see that? We're drawn to beauty. The second thing I hope you take away from this is I want you to see the Psalms for their relevance to your life. It's amazing. These poems, these songs are so relevant to your day-to-day -day existence. I hope you see that. Thirdly, I hope you see how the Psalms speak to your head and heart simultaneously. I wish I could just develop that more for you, but all through the Scriptures, <clears throat> we are instructed in our minds, and all through the Scriptures, our affections are stirred and we're moved in our heart, but the Psalms have this seeming unique ability to speak to our head and heart at the same time. Pretty amazing. And then the last thing I want you to take away from this is that the Psalms really are worth a lot of your time. They're worth a lot of your time. And there's not many days that go by that I'm not in the Psalms somehow or another, but it'll be more now. It'll be more now. Psalm 73, as I said earlier, was written by a man named Asaph. Asaph was a man who was appointed by God to lead worship in the tabernacle before the temple was built. Some think that when the temple was built, he went in that a little bit, did the same thing, but more than likely it was his ancestors that carried that on. But God appointed him to be what we would call today the worship pastor for the people of God. Think Asaph Nutter. Think that. <laughs> so he was their worship leader, a very public figure, in the nation of Israel who came and did exactly what our worship team did today. He led that. And he practiced with the uh, people who played the instruments. He just was their worship leader. And in this psalm, he lets us in on a very personal experience that he had. And I'm so thankful that he did. And God told him, you need to write that out. God does that for us when we struggle sometimes. I remember coming through some of my deepest struggle. I told the Lord, I'll never tell anybody in the church what I just went through and the details of it. And um, he held me down with his hands around my throat saying, I didn't do this with you and for you to keep to yourself. 
And he told Asaph, I want you to write down what you've just been through. It was a, it was a deep internal struggle for him. It wasn't the kind of hardship where he was dealing with physical ailment or disease. He wasn't fighting any enemies. There wasn't any kind of external resistance to him. This was all internal. And I'm going to call it this morning a crisis of faith because that's what it is. And I'm going to show you, and you will probably won't need much convincing, that going through seasons where our faith falters and even sometimes fails is common. It's the human experience for the people of God. We go in and out of those kinds of experiences. Um, the anatomy of this psalm is not hard at all to see. And the way to see it is to understand Asaph's story and this ex- Asaph's story, this experience that he went through, and then afterwards the structure just sort of emerges. It becomes evident after you understand his story. Let me summarize uh, the experience and the difficulty and the crisis of faith that he was going to, going through. Asaph moved into this period of his life where he was deeply struggling, where he could not find peace. We don't know what it was except that as he began to really look closely at people who were not the people of God, God rejecting idolaters, arrogant, wicked, violent people, when he looked around to them, they were wealthy, they had a lot of possessions, and it seemed to them, to him, like their life was just one of lush and luxury. And that caused such a stirring within him that his faith began to falter. Here he was, a man of God, a worship pastor. Here he is, one who was endeavoring to and fighting to live an upright, holy life. And yet he was stricken, he was suffering, he was going through hardships. And yet the ones who hated God had this life of ease. You see, a crisis of faith, listen, is when what you believe to be true doesn't match your experience. So let me walk you through this psalm and let you see it. I'll just highlight a little bit. He begins by saying, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That word truly... I think probably better could be translated surely. In our vernacular, we might put it this way. I know that I know that I know. I'm firm in this one. God's good to Israel. I know that to be true. But then watch. But as for me, during this time of my life, my feet almost stumbled. My steps nearly slipped. I almost fell. And here's why. I became envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. How about that? I wanted the life they had. I no longer was content with my life. And here's why, verse 4. As I look at them, they have no pangs until death. They don't struggle until they die. I know they're going to die. But until then, they're not struggling. Their bodies are fat and sleek. A fat body in those days was representative of wealth and power and prestige. I would have been a king in those days. (laughs) I just knew I had to say something because I knew what you'd be thinking at that point. (laughs) I'm working on it. They're fat and sleek. They have a lot of money, a lot of possessions. They live in big houses. They have multiple houses. They drive the best camels. They have so many different pairs of sandals. It's not my experience. I became envious of that. Verse 5, they're not in trouble as others are. They don't get in trouble. They're too powerful for that. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, because they're that way, pride is their necklace. See how he says their necklace? What that means is on display. They have no problem. They don't hide their pride. Their haughtiness is out for everyone to see. Violence covers them as a garment. These are oppressing, violent people who he's saying, I wanted what they had. I wanted to be who they were. 
Verse 7, their eyes swell out through their fatness and their hearts overflow with folly. In other words, they're so rich and so wealthy, it even goes to what they look at. All they look at is more and more and more. Always reminds me of when I read that of what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2. Don't love the world or anything of the world. And then he specifies what he's talking about, the pride of life and the pride of eyes. And Asaph is saying, these guys have these kind of eyes, and they were proud of it. They were haughty. It was no problem for them. And then look how they verbalize all this. They scoff and they speak with malice. They don't care who they talk about. Lawfully, they threaten oppression. They're violent. They'll oppress to get what they want to get. Nothing and no one will stop them from attaining more. Verse 9, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts through the earth. You see, they're not even afraid to talk to God the way they want to talk to God. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. See, like me, we look at them and think there's there's no issue with the people. Verse 11, here's what they say. How can God know anything? Is there knowledge in the Most High? You're fools for believing in God. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't care. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. They just keep getting more and more and more and more. And then he moves on to this, and so since I was here, this is the way I began to feel, verse 13, in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. I have fought on a day-by-day basis to honor and obey God. And not just in my external life, but in my heart, I have fought for a pure heart and to keep my hands clean before him. All day long, verse 14, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. You see, they're not stricken and rebuked, but I am. I wake every morning feeling unhappy and feeling suffering and pain. Verse 15, if I had said I'll speak thus, in other words, if I had verbalized this, I probably would have betrayed a generation of children, of your children, of God's people. I didn't spread around how I was feeling. Verse 16, but then I thought how to understand this, and it seemed like a wearisome task. I could not figure this out. Why do they live like this? And I live and feel like this. That made no sense to me, verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Here's a change. All of a sudden, I saw them differently, verse 18. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they're destroyed in a moment, swept away by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul felt this way, it was embittered. When I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, here's where I'm landing. Through all of this time, here's where I'm landing. I'm continually with you, and I know you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. So here's where I'm standing. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. How about that for a transition? My flesh and my heart may fail, which it will. I'll be brutish probably again. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Behold, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful. But as for me, here's how I'm feeling these days. It's good to be near God. I've run to him and I've made him my refuge that I may tell of your works. There's his story. That's what he went through. You know, we're not told if this time of discouragement and frustration lasted a day or a year. Did it last some weeks or did it last a month? Don't know. Uh, If I'm a guessing man... I'd say it lasted for a while. I don't know if it was a year, but I bet it took him a while to work through this kind of thing. But after you see the story, then all of a sudden the structure, I think, is clear. It might not be to you right now, but I bet if you read it over and over alone, you'd see it. There's three different parts to the structure of this psalm. And I just have to borrow from Old Testament scholar Walter Bruggeman. 
what he says about these three parts and how he heads them. It's just the best I read. I thought and thought to come up with something different, different words, but I couldn't. I, just, I thought, I'm just going to leave this alone and bring you what Bruggeman said. He said there's three parts to this. Number one, he calls orientation. Number two, disorientation. And number three, we see him reoriented. By orientation, what Bruggeman means is we see that Asaph starts um, understanding something and standing on something and believing something. And then he moves into disorientation. He gets confused, frustrated. He even said, didn't he? I tried to figure this out, and I couldn't. There was a disorientation within him. And then finally he gets reoriented, and he lands in a more holy and obedient and place of relief and place of peace again. Let me illustrate those three, orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Imagine that you're driving to someone's house, and you'd been in their neighborhood before, but you weren't driving, you didn't pay much attention, and that was the only time you'd been there, so you really didn't know your way around, but you had the address, and you figured you could find it, right? You were oriented correct. I know where the neighborhood is. I'm, I'm sure of that. But then once you get into that neighborhood, you begin driving the route that you think you needed to drive, and all of a sudden the left-hand turn that you thought was going to be there and be the right thing wasn't there, and you looked up and the street that you were on changed names. Don't you hate when that happens? And You could just feel your wife's eyes looking at you, and she keeps trying to give her counsel. Listen, this is a good illustration. Let me get this off my chest too, will you? You know she's looking at you, and she's trying to tell you what she thinks you should do, and you just put a hand up like that, and you know you're going to regret that later, but you just do it anyway, and you tell her just to sit there and let you drive. You know what you're doing, and you keep driving what all of a sudden feels like you're driving in circles. You are disoriented in this place that you were oriented to go to. Soon enough, you decide to humble yourself, and so you see someone walking, and you stop, and you roll down your window and you ask for instructions and he tells you where to go and there's this reorientation that's happening in you. All of a sudden it it sort of falls into place and you hear it and you turn your car around and you start driving there and you just out of the corner of your eye look at your wife and she's smugly looking out the front window and not saying anything and you're thinking that's a good thing she's not saying anything at this point. (laughs) And finally after being reoriented and following this guy's directions you find the house and as you pull into the driveway you think well... I'm going to give her a kiss and just let her know I love her. And so you put the car in park, and by the time you turn towards her, you see her back as she's getting out of the car. And (laughs) even though she denies it, later she slams the car door, and when she does, there's a terror that chills down your spine, (laughs) realizing what's coming. And it's so terrifying that you even consider faking a heart attack just to get out of there (laughs) to change her mood. Okay. That was a good illustration (laughs) and felt like a good cathartic therapy session for me, so thank you. No, don't. No, don't. You heard it. Orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Boy, Bruggeman is right. He starts out, doesn't he, oriented. God is good to Israel. I know that I know that I know that that's true. But all of a sudden, I got this disorientation with me, this confusion, this frustration. Because as I looked around, they were living lives that I should be living. Because I do belong to God. I am walking with God. I obey God. I fight for a pure heart and clean hands. And look at them. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They don't need problems. They're not stricken. They keep getting richer. They're violent. They're oppressed. There's no judgment. Nothing's happening to them. They just keep getting richer and richer And the lush, luxurious lifestyle just keeps increasing on their behalf. And I don't get this. This should be me. And when I tried to get it, I just was really messed up. Just was really messed up. I was in this crisis of faith at this moment. What I believed should be true wasn't true. Wasn't matching my experience. And then he moves into reorientation when he says, and I went into the sanctuary of God and I started to see some things differently. And I saw their end. 
This is not going to end well for them who are idolaters, violent and oppressive, and living the rich, luxurious lifestyle. It's not going to end well with them. And I feel so reoriented. Here's what I'm remembering and recognizing and finding peace and trust in. God's with me. He's holding my hand. He's mine. Someday I know he's going to bring me to glory, but right now as I live, I recognize there's nothing up there that I want more than him. And now all of a sudden, everything that I wanted in them, I don't want this earth actually has nothing I desire. I'm kind of falling out of love with this world. Their riches and luxury have lost its luster. And what I've done is I've made God my portion. I don't want their portion anymore. God's my portion and I'm probably going to mess up again. My heart and my flesh may fail. You know, I might become a bitter brute again before God, but I do know in and through it all, he doesn't leave me. He's the strength of my heart. He is my portion. He'll always be with me. And you know what? It's a good life to be near God. This is orientation. He got disoriented, and then he came back. He came back stronger. He came back more firm, more reliant, with more joy and more perspective. Oh, I'll just say it one more time in the Psalms. There's so much I wanted to say at this point as we start meditating. There's so much power and richness and truth, and I hope you'll just spend some time this week and Psalm 73, and just look for some things that you can bring into your life. I'm going to give you two, and we're going to spend the lion's share of our time now. And number one, here's the first thing I want us to meditate on, and it's this. Disorientation is the unavoidable experience for God's people. Now, I almost said all God's people. And I actually believe that to be true. I'm very, I'm very suspicious of you who are sitting out there right now thinking, I've never gone through that. Very suspicious of you. I believe we all go through it to various degrees, various lengths of times, various intensities, but I believe we all go through that. Where all of a sudden, maybe this has been your experience, where all of a sudden you're going all along in life with everything being okay, and in the blink of an eye you're in a whirlwind. Maybe you've gone to the doctor because you thought you just had a little cold and needed an antibiotic, and what he discovers in there, he looks at you and says, you need to go right to the hospital right now. All of a sudden. Or you get the phone call about the car accident your loved one's been in. Whew. You just get caught in this whirlwind with a blink of an eye without expecting it. Or maybe you've been praying for someone for decades, praying and praying and praying and nothing. Or maybe you go into work and out of the blue your boss tells you you don't have a job anymore. I don't know what it is. But we find ourselves all of a sudden in a period that usually we don't expect that comes over us, and we're in the middle of a crisis of faith. And you'll know you're in one when you're asking questions like, where are you, God? Don't you hear me, God? Why aren't you answering me, God? And you'll know you're in this crisis of faith when you make statements like, I'd never do my kids this way. I'd never let my kids go through something like this. I don't think you're seeing me. I'm not sure you're there. I question your love. And then it usually always gives way to, why? A crisis of faith. You know, I call it being shaken, because that's what it feels like. It feels like internally you're just being shaken and shaken and shaken. 
because what you believed to be true all along didn't match what your experience is at this moment in the middle of this confusion and frustration. And what you're finding is just being shaken. And like in an earthquake, all around you is shaking. I also like to think of it a little bit as soul quake, where everything in your soul and everything in your heart just seems to be moving and shifting. You know what? You thought you were on solid ground when you went into that doctor's office. Now all of a sudden it's shaking and moving and shifting. And your soul is quaking. You ever been there? The Bible's filled with stalwarts of the faith. Heroes of the faith who had crises of faith. Who were shaken. And we got to watch him go through it. Well, John the Baptist was one, wasn't he? John the Baptist had an orientation for sure. Gave his life to God. Wore rags. Ate this meager, gross diet, except for the honey. <clears throat> <laughs> Removed himself from society to be alone with God knew that God had set him apart to be the forerunner for Jesus, to blaze the trail for the Messiah when he began his earthly ministry. And God told him when that time had come, and God told John the Baptist he needed to go to the Jordan River. And when John saw Jesus coming, he, here's his orientation, he said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist is the one that baptized Jesus He's the one that was there and heard God trumpet from the heavens. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. It looked like a dove and came over him. Oh, he was oriented. He came out of that water and as Jesus began his ministry, he knew exactly who Jesus was and he, he told his followers he had a big following now he must increase and I must decrease look at that man I'm not worthy to bow down and touch his sandals he took on the religious elite he was courageous he was fearless he didn't care oh he was oriented he got it he knew that he knew that he knew and then he got thrown in prison and there he languished. You know, most people, we're not told, but most historians and commentators believe he was in prison for just under two years before he was beheaded and killed. And while he was in prison, you know, his friends would visit him every now and then. And you know what he said to his friends? Do me a favor. Carry a message to Jesus, would you? Ask him, are you the one that we should have been looking for, or is there another one coming? Because I don't get this. This doesn't make sense to me. I've, I've heard you've been in this territory over the last two years. And as he said that, <clears throat> Jesus was in a town called Nain, which was just under around 100 miles, which is a big deal to travel in those days, but you could have done it within a two-year period. And John the Baptist even knew that Jesus could have just thought open those prison doors and they would have opened. And John said, I just don't get it. So go ask him, are you really the Messiah? This, this guy was oriented. I mean, I hear about that story all the time and I think, Whew. well, if he did. And we know probably the prominent one in the scriptures is Job. There's a guy that was oriented. As a matter of fact, the testimony about Job at the beginning of that book is that he was a man who obeyed God, feared God, was blameless in all of his way. He shunned evil. Job was the godliest man in that area at that time, and we know the story what happened to him. And after his kids were killed... And his wife seemingly turned on him. And if she didn't turn on him, she, what she said was mean and cruel and not something you want to hear when you're suffering. Oh, just go ahead and die. 
he had three friends that he thought were close friends, and they came to him, and they just ended up being agitators, blaming him for what he was in the middle of. And Job held on to his faith, but he reached a point where all of a sudden he started saying things like this to the heavens. You're cruel. You're mocking my pain and suffering. You are unjust. Job did. I had a time. I've had several times, but the most intense was during the darkest period of my life. I began to think there was no God. And I said it to a dear friend named Rich Hart, worked with me on staff at a church. We were sitting in the Walmart parking lot while our wives went in there to get some ice cream or something to, to go back to their house. And I said to him, Richie, I just don't know if there's a God anymore. Do you ever doubt if there's a God? And he said, no. And he was so gentle and loving to me. But I really was in a place at that point in my life where I was thinking, there ain't no way there can be a God who loves me and let this go on for this long. A crisis of faith being shaken. And Asaph had that. He said, I just don't get this. This does not make sense to me at all. I don't know how to figure this out. You know, when you're in a crisis of faith, you only, according to my estimation anyway, maybe you can think of something else, you only have four options. Number one, you can reject God and run, and it happens way too much, and it's heartbreaking to see. Where it bothers you so much, your faith is shaking so much, that you just end up saying, I will not do this anymore, and you walk away from God, and you never return. That's an option. You know what John said in his first letter about people like that? They went out from us, but they never returned, therefore they never were of us. Side note, only truly unsaved people can walk away and never come back. The authentically saved are held. What did Asaph say? You hold my right hand. So that's an option. Just reject God and go. The next option is this. You can create new illusions for your life. Okay? And I'm going to put in parenthesis after that, maybe you can, manufacture a theology that works for you. Because that's what's happening in a crisis of faith. The illusions of life are vaporizing in your heart and mind. The illusion of Asaph was that these people are blessed, I'm not. You want to know how deep the illusion that Asaph was in the middle of went? In verse 3 he said, I envied the arrogant, I envied their, listen, prosperity. Now here's the thing about that word. That word comes from a Hebrew word that is almost always translated shalom. The blessing that only God's people have. Not just peace, it goes deeper than that. Well, I don't have time. You you Google it and read about it. You know what it means? To be complete and to be whole. Because when you're struggling and suffering and in pain, it just feels like everything's falling apart and you. Shalom brings it all back together and you get peace and some serenity and tranquility. And you know what he was saying? Here's the illusion. They get shalom. I don't. It's an illusion. Hang in there, what I'm about to say. We all live with illusions, and we don't even really know it until we're awakened to it like this. I know we think we have the corner on truth. I know we think that we understand everything there is to understand about God. I know every now and then we'll say, well, God is mysterious, but the things that we're sure of, we're absolutely sure of, we live with these thoughts and feelings and things that we 
believed to be true, and at best they can be incomplete, and at worst they can be false and wrong. Now, for those who walk with God, it's what I just now said is not true as far as his existence, and you know he's there, and those things, those fundamentals of the faith. But beyond that, like thinking your life should go well, and it doesn't, and those rich people over there have it going well is an illusion. And we all have those kind of illusions, and they're vaporizing when you're in a crisis of faith. When your soul's quaking, they're going away. And that doesn't make sense. So one of the options you have is to create a new kind of theology that works for you. So you say and you think things like, well, God doesn't have anything to do with this. This is because of free will. Or I believe God is sovereign, but not here. Whatever that looks like. I always think when I hear things like that, and I've done it, by the way, way back early in my Christian life. I always think when I hear like things like that is, oh, what we're doing is trying to make an excuse for God. We're trying to explain Him in ways that isn't true. You can manufacture your own theology that works for you at that point which incidentally makes you an idolater. That's another sermon. Those are your options. You can reject him and leave and never come back. You can create new illusions as the ones you had were vaporizing. Or number three, you know what? You can become bitter, stay in the church, never verbalize that you're necessarily not believing God or not trusting him, but you're getting bitter. I can show you these people. You know some, don't you? Just grumpy people. Just life hasn't gone the way they think life has gone. Life's dealt them a terrible hand. And sometimes they are really serious victims of some horrible things, but want to stay in it. And all that does within them is just make them grumpy and mad and discontented. And you just make everybody around you miserable. Asaph even said that. You know what? When I was like this, I was embittered. I was like a brute. You see, that was brutish before you. I was an animal, God. You can reject and run. You can create a new illusion, your own personal theology, or you can just let yourself be bitter, or you can, here comes number four, draw near to God. And I'm recommending number four. That's the second thing I wanted us to meditate on just briefly, and that is when in the midst of a crisis of faith, a disorientation, you must draw near to God if you want the reorientation. There ain't no way, I humbly admit in front of my wife back there, I was going to find that house until I got a little speck of humility and rolled down my window and asked that's number four when you're in the middle of a time that's completely frustrating and confusing and what you always believed to be true was not matching your experience you need to roll down your window that's what it says in verse 17 that was the pivot point in this chapter this is what i thought this is what i felt and then he says this until I entered the sanctuary of God. See? Until I took it to God. I took it to Him. And you take it to God. When you go before Him and you say, it makes no sense to me. I don't get it. So I'm wrestling with it. And you wrestle before God. That's okay. He's got big shoulders. A lot of times the psalmist did it. So you wrestle with God and you don't get that, but then you move into this place where, like that song we sung today, nothing in my hands do I bring to you, and I'm, I'm not bringing my frustrations anymore or my answers or what I think you should do. I'm realizing, God, that there are some things on this earth that I'm never going to understand. i got this mortal puny mind, and I know that you don't answer to me, and I don't get this, and I may never get this, but this much, oh God, I know I want you. And all of a sudden, the reorientation begins to come as you meet with him. Number four is your option. 
And I'm, I'm going to even push it a little further and say it's the only sane option you have. It's the only one that makes logical, emotional, spiritual, physical sense. The other three options are insanity. It reminds me whenever Jesus had this big group of followers and they are kind of they couldn't take what he was saying. Just too, too much, and they were falling away. And Jesus looked at his twelve buddies and he said, You guys going too? And Peter spoke up first and said, Where else would we go? Let me add an implication to that. We're having a hard time with what you're saying, too. But where else would we go? And then he ends with this, for you alone have the words of eternal life. Implicit in that statement, we know you're God. Why would we run from God? There's a couple of takeaways that I want to leave you with. I'm not quite done, so don't zip up your Bible. And I'm going to give them to you by way of questions, and I'm not, you, you need to think about these later because they're important. Because if you're not in the middle of one of these times, it's going to come, and it's important that you have these answered and you keep them before you. Number one, what's your orientation now? In other words, if you were writing this psalm, what would verse 1 look like? What would verse 1 say? I know that God is God. Surely He is God. I'm not budging from that. I know that I know that I know that this is the right neighborhood. I'm not feeling right inside, but I know this about God. What's your orientation? You need to decide that right now. What are the stakes in your life that you will not budge from? And the second one that you need to think about for a takeaway is this. What do you treasure most in your life? It's really important to figure that out. Because for a season there, Asaph was treasuring more than God all those camels, all those servants, all that money, all that luxury. And listen to this. He even wanted, now listen, more than God. He treasured more than God a pain-free life. Whatever you treasure most, if it's not God, someday may lead you into a crisis of faith. Let me give you a little help in finding what you treasure most. Look where your time is spent. Look where your money is spent. And look where you find the most joy. Answer those and you'll find your treasure. Thank you, God, for Asaph, Psalm 73. We bow our hearts and our heads and our eyes in prayer right now to um, confess that you are God. And when these crises come, I want to thank you in advance that you're patient. And we are not consumed because of your great love. And Father, we bring afresh to you now our hearts and our lives and I want to pray especially for those who really are in the middle of a crisis of faith right now. Oh, Father, undergird them with strength and courage and endurance. And help them to start seeing their way clear to be able to say, God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. I will make him my portion forever. Amen. Um.